Hello everyone. How's everyone doing this morning? I hope you can see and hear me. Just uh, doing a technology check, make sure um, it's working fine. Can you guys see me? Can you guys hear me? If you can put it on the chat, please. Um, that way I'll get some feedback and I know everything's okay. Perfect, thank you. Uh, let me just uh, put the presentation and make sure that that's also coming up on screen. Cool, you should see something on your screen in terms of the presentation as well. Um, is that also showing up okay for you? I want to get some feedback before I start just to make sure <laughs> it's all visible before I start talking uh, turns out it's not showing up so you should see a presentation and you should see my video as well um, if you can put the feedback on the chat that would would help me uh, um, gauge slides are good okay perfect thank you thank you very much um, so uh, thank you uh, very much for <laughs> for attending I'm not sure um, if we've got any um, any people on the um, on here because I can't see the chat uh, with with uh, comments on it so I'm just making sure oh yes yeah, sorry yeah per I was looking in the wrong place. Let me just make sure I've got it here. Uh, so, sorry. Um, just checking that uh, the uh, the the uh, the presentation is is it not good quality? Is the quality not showing up correctly? Is that uh, is that right? Is it is it readable slides? Um, okay, I'm not getting any feedback, so I'd, I'm assuming everything is okay. Um, so I'll just make give it a quick start then. Uh, thank you everyone for joining. So uh, um, so today, as as you already know, uh, we'll be talking uh, about the lessons. Uh, apologies, sorry, I just uh, see some something on chat. We cannot read the last black text uh, sorry I'm not sure what you mean by last black text let me try something else I'm going to try and share uh, it on my screen instead and see if that helps okay uh, I'm gonna switch to my machine and uh, hopefully that helps. So uh, um, I switched to to sharing my desktop, and I'm sharing PowerPoint here. So uh, is that a bit more clear? Uh, before I actually um, start, I want to make sure you guys can actually read it. So the, the disadvantage of this is that I can't see the chat. I have to switch um, to check the chat. So uh, let me just make sure everything is okay. Just give me a second. A lot better okay it's okay all right perfect so um, I'll leave that um, I'll check the chat um, periodically to make sure everything is okay um, but uh, let's 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 make a start um, so i um, just gonna go full screen so just to talk briefly about um, uh, about myself, so uh, my name is Azim, and I've building uh, um, RPA robots since 2016 uh, when I got involved with uh, with this technology. And um, you know, I started uh, working with um, Totonomy, which was um, basically Blue Prism repackaged. Totonomy is actually being acquired by Blue Prism now, and uh, I then uh, started going into UiPath, and so I'm certified on both. I'm a Blue Prism certified professional developer. And uh, for the past couple of years, I've worked mainly as um, a lead developer. Uh, 
Um, so um, I've got my own consultancy that I started in 2017 and uh, I've been supporting my clients through that and um, you know over over that period I have uh, been working um, you know I've developed or been involved in development supervised and 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 seen the work of around you know 50 uh, plus robots so I've not developed 50 robots <laughs> but you know I've been involved in developing co-developing supervising a lot of different things uh, at around 50 projects so that's kind of the um, experience um, that uh, you know I've had uh, for the last couple of years and I'm hoping that today I can share some of the information with you um, and hopefully you find this this useful so I'm just going to do a quick check just to make sure everything is fine on the chat here I don't want to carry on talking okay perfect so I don't see any any issues or complaints of the technology so I'll just carry on um, so um, that's that's who I am this is what I do and uh, I wanted to get a bit of a of an understanding of who um, the audience is today. So um, if you could go to that website you see on uh, paulev.com forward slash azimzikar084, um, you can go on your mobile, your laptop, anything, you won't need to register. Um, you can give your name if you like, you don't have to. Um, and what I would like you for you to put in there is uh, your job title and uh, all the industry that you're working in so you can put one or the other you can put both and and as you guys populate that um, I should have it come up here on screen so the website is here at the top uh, polev.com forward slash azimzikar084 actually what I'll do is to make things easier I can put it on your chat as well just so that uh, uh, you guys can see that uh, just give me a second. Paul EV. Um, for a nice little seam, the car. Four. Okay, so if you guys can go on that on that link for me and just put in some some information and it should come up on screen here I haven't had anyone enter anything yet so <laughs> I'm trying to get a bit of a view of who the audience is today um, so yes please thank you very much for whoever submitted that if you can uh, carry on submitting uh, if I have a few people at least I can get an idea of which industry uh, our audience is mainly um, in and what your role actually is you know are you a manager or developer um, or, or something else that, that really helps me kind of talk from the uh, perspective uh, that, that, that I see here. So I was hoping for a bit more uh, contribution uh, on that. So um, I'll give it another minute, see if I can get a few more things coming through. Um, so uh, if you go to the website polyv.com, it's at the top on the screen, forward slash azimzikar084, put in your um, job title your uh, your um, your industry I'll get an idea so I can see here that we've got some some uh, developers and managers um, uh, some project managers which is great and uh, I see a big big RPA there which indicates that a few more few people have put that as the answer and I've got um, someone from the telco industry as well which is um, really good so um, a lot of varied roles in, in, in our audience today. So we've got some managers, BI, PM, developer, and, and that's great because obviously, um, you, you know, the things we talk about uh, will be relevant for, for all. So um, let's move on and I'll car carry on and cover the schedule. So I will very briefly talk about what robotic process automation is. Now I understand many of you probably already know. Uh, but just in case, um, as this is being recorded in the future, um, this uh, presentation is looked at, uh, it might be useful if someone uh, isn't aware of what it is. Um, and then obviously I'll cover the lessons learned, um, which is the main part of the presentation. And then um, we'll have a Q&A right at the end. And we'll leave about five minutes for a Q&A. So that should be sufficient time. Um, and uh, I'm just going to check the chat. Everything's okay, so I shall carry on. Look, so um, what is RPA? And uh, in, in brief, um, it focuses a lot on doing automation based on user interface. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the advantages of RPA is that, uh, you, you know, it's sold as low code, although, you know, some may argue that this is not necessarily the case, but the, the thing is it, it puts a technology that has been, uh, you know, around for a while uh, and, and adds workflow to it and it makes it a lot easier for less uh, technological savvy people to actually use as a technology um, and and you know it's mainly to replace things like Excel macros and, and things like that you, you want to have uh, something that you can audit and 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 you can scale up and you have a, a real operation when, when you're doing things like that so RPA kind of fill, fills that gap although the technology itself the underlying technology isn't new uh, because you know you've you've had Selenium in the past w where they've used uh, you know an application to automate things on your desktop or browser perhaps, but um, you know when RPA came in, it filled in a, a gap that was there, uh, which is great. And um, you know as you probably already know, there are advantages to this technology, um, and one of them, and the main ones being um, you know fast deployment. You can quickly automate things because you are doing things via the user interface you don't need back-end APIs and things like that to do your automations and and you know even outside of that the the other things um, that are important is that you can automate any type of application virtually speaking um, because it's not just user interface you can use other things within RPA uh, you can call APIs etc so the, there are things to consider it's not all uh, uh, you know, all great, and there are things that uh, can can be a problem if they're not looked at. For example, sync cost being one of them. So uh, you know, if you take on too much, and you you will struggle to then, uh, you know, make that money back basically just by by spending on your licensing costs. Um, also, uh, the, the as mainly you are relying on user interface. Uh, a thing to consider or a disadvantage is that, you know, if that application changes, the UI changes, then you obviously got a problem with the robot that you've built. So um, that's in brief what RPA is and a few um, uh, small uh, things to consider. Um, my apologies that I'm, I'm having to do this constantly is just to make sure that I check the chat and that there isn't anything in there uh, for my attention. So perfect, thank you for that. That's done. So um, I'm going to go into the lessons learned now, and uh, there's a disclaimer I like to to give here. I think it's very important um, to to cover this part. Um, obviously, everything that I'll cover today is from from my perspective. So um, you know, as a lead developer, uh, there is a specific perspective that um, I bring. So obviously, I've seen um, and things in the in the last couple of years that I've been doing RPA. But you know, it is important to to understand that whatever I tell you, it's solely from my perspective. You may have a different perspective, especially as we got, uh, you know, project managers here, and and you know, I can't claim to be a project manager, so you know, there could be a different perspective. So that's uh, an important disclaimer. And the other thing is, you know, the examples I'll give you, they are real world examples. Um, this is not theory. Um, so hopefully, it helps. Uh, you in your journey perhaps uh, it helps you not go get into those pitfalls um, so I'm hoping it will be really useful and uh, <laughs> with a lot of things that I'll share with you uh, a lot of lessons that that I've learned or my the team I've been in has learned um, you know it's something that could have possibly been prevented but if you think about you know when RPA started a few years back there wasn't a lot of information like there is today uh, you know, so obviously it was very easy to, to go into trial and error kind of strategies and, and learn a lot from it. So, um, yeah, a lot of stuff you'll probably be thinking, you know, this could have been avoided or etc. cetera. But, um, you know, it's it's about learning and, and hopefully you, you know these lessons, but if you don't, then at least you, you have some awareness. So that's uh, the disclaimer I wanted to cover. So let's just uh, jump right into lesson number one that um, that uh, I'd like to share with you and that's the vendor <laughs> so as uh, you probably know and seen there are a lot of RPA vendors coming into the market now and uh, a lot of them you know cover different things and different areas and 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 different perspectives so one of the things that's extremely important is that you choose the right vendor so I've, I've been with clients that uh, have had to change their vendors 
And that isn't an ideal situation because obviously you've spent two years doing something with one vendor and then you find out actually, you know, because we didn't consider everything, that's not the right vendor. So let's switch. And you can imagine the, the culture shock you get and, and all the issues that come with that. So one of the things to consider when looking for a vendor is to think about how you would like uh, to go about um, you know, hosting this technology. Um, are you looking for something, uh, a vendor that you know, has everything on the cloud? Um, or um, are you okay to have it on premise? Are you going to install it on your own uh, infrastructure, on your own network? And, and the reason um, that is quite a big deal is because obviously, if you go down the cloud route, there are things that you need to consider um, like if you speak to your infrastructure team, uh, you know, opening up firewalls and gateways, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but if you're on-premise, you probably don't need to worry about that. You just, um, you know, speak to the IT team uh, the, the, uh, and explain what you're looking to onboard and, and they can take care of that for you. So it could be as easy as that. And, and also the, the platform that you're choosing, the vendor that you're choosing, needs to support whatever strategy you've gone for. If you want both, you need to make sure that that vendor is able to do both. So that's the first question um, you, you need to be thinking about. Um, do you want an on-cloud or on-premise um, solution? Uh, and think about the drawbacks for both and, 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 the, and, and how that's going to kind of shape your strategy. Uh, the second one is to do with the platform itself, the, the tool itself. Um, you know, how easy is it to use? So currently, uh, a lot of the vendors are targeting citizen automation, right? So uh, you see a lot of um, the vendors, especially like Microsoft, um, is trying to uh, make it sound like, you know, uh, robotics is for all the citizens and they should be able to do it. So that's fine. I mean, if your strategy is to go down that route eventually, um, then you need to have a vendor that is um, the, or a tool uh, that is equally as easy to use if you want to go down that route. You can't choose something that's fully just coding, no low code uh, platform, and then try and, and do citizen automation. So obviously that's, that's, that's kind of obvious, but um, you know, a different perspective would also be that the team that you have that's going to do the work, um, you know, consult with them. So I've been uh, in, in situations where, um, you know, we, we're working as a team and next thing we know, a business deal has been made by management and we're onboarding this new tool based on the marketing that they were given and also the sales team chat with that tool, but no consultation was made uh, with us in the team of developers. And, you know, it worked great because it was easy, an easy tool to use, but, um, and, and, and talking about Blue Prism here, quite easy to understand, quite easy to play with. Uh, but if you've got something a bit more complicated and you haven't consulted with your team and it's not that easy to use, then you're going to have problems with, um, you know, um, adoption by your team and, and making sure that you have the right skill set to, to, to produce your automations for you. And uh, lastly, uh, attended or unattended. Again, so I think a lot of um, RPA vendors now kind of target both, but uh, it's very important for you to think whether you know you are looking for an um, a tool that's focused solely on uh, attended robots. So you want to install it on users' machines and and help get the robots kind of helping them, or are you looking to have um, you know all this stuff in the back end in virtual servers, uh, and you're going to install the application there and maintain it there? So that's an extremely important uh, you know question to ask and and think about. So for example, Blue Prism. Uh, you know, when I was working with it uh, back a few years now, um, you know, they were mainly targeting unattended. Uh, I don't know if that is changing now with, with the landscape changing, but, um, you know, they were solely kind of enterprise level unattended automation and it worked great that way. Whereas UiPath, you can do both. You can do attended or unattended, whichever way you prefer. Uh, and, you know, both have their advantages and disadvantages. But the main thing is you got to think about it because, you know, are you going to have automations that, um, you know, can run end to end without human intervention? Is that the main kind of uh, work that you're going to have? Or 
uh, is a lot of the work you're going to have will need human intervention at some point, so you need attended robots. Um, so that's another question to think about. So that's, um, that's lesson number one, and that covers the vendor. So I'm just going to quickly check the chat, make sure everything is okay, and that we haven't got any 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 questions here. Uh, that's fine. Everything's looking great. So uh, I'm hoping you can still hear me. You can still see the presentation, and everything is great. If I could have some feedback on the chat, that would really help me uh, make sure everything is is going okay. Perfect, thank you. So uh, let's just carry on. So uh, lesson number two is in regards to the team. So I've touched a bit upon this already uh, uh, in regards to um, you know making sure that your team is consulted when you're choosing a vendor, um, but also um, that you have the right level of experience to pick up that technology. So um, I've had instances where uh, you know, we've we've got people in the team that uh, um, you know have had to be trained to 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 kind of look at technical kind of t tools. Um, so coming in from the business side, a lot of the times that didn't work. So you want to make sure that whatever tool you're bringing in and uh, you, that you've got the team uh, that is the right level of experience um, to handle it. So. Robotics is, is a bit different than usual development. Um, some would say easier, some would say it requires different perspectives. Um, so that's very important to consider. Uh, it's not just about technical skill, but it's also about um, logic. Uh, and also um, you want to, to make sure that, you know, the more that they're aware of other processes within the business, it helps when they're doing automation. So, the, the main and the biggest question you can have when you're building a team or center of excellence is, you know, what type of, of team are you building and how are you going to get there? So, you know, I'm obviously a contractor and, um, you know, I, I prefer to work in, in that way. Um, but I have seen uh, situations where we've got teams where everyone is a contractor, so there is no permanent uh, members in that team and we're building a center of excellence so what happens when the contractors suddenly decide to leave there is no permanent people to leave this information to so the reason I'm asking that you consider and, and, and look at permanent versus contracting or both and think about the plan is to ensure um, transfer of information so and, and information retention you know, it, you, it's 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 great to, to start with contractors, and obviously I wouldn't have uh, a job if that wasn't the case, but um, uh, it's very important to have a plan of retaining um, the knowledge that contractor is bringing into the team. Uh, um, so having a permanent uh, member of staff or a plan to bring in permanent people to take over, that's quite an important um, uh, lesson that you should have. So, um, you know, recently the law changed about contracting in the UK and I had to leave a, a previous client and obviously um, that wasn't planned and, uh, you know, I just had to leave. And the good thing is that all of the ways, the, the processes that we did, um, they were very strictly followed. So the information is retained um, by the processes, even though they didn't have any permanent people, um, you know, the information is retained in the processes and then that ensures knowledge transfer. So it doesn't have to be in a form of, you know, permanent members, you, you, as long as you have a system that works of retaining information, that, that should be good enough and helps with the longevity of your project. Um, and the other thing is retention. So we talked about information retention from 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 the from the team, but retention of the staff themselves. So if you've got permanent team members, you know robotics is is quite an exciting field at the moment. There's a lot of opportunity. A lot of people, uh, you know, get get quite a bit of opportunity around that. So uh, it's important that you think about uh, once you've you know decided on how you're retaining your information. How do you keep your team motivated and how do you retain your team? Um, and how do you make sure that obviously they don't take this knowledge and just leave? Um, so that's an extremely important thing to think about uh, because you, you may struggle to keep a ro robotics developers or contractors, you know, in your team due to the amount of opportunity. So uh, make sure that this is considered and, and planned for. And, and that, um, 
touches a bit upon what I'm going to talk next, which is uh, probably quite exciting, and I'm sure we'll all have some opinions on it. I'm just going to uh, quickly check the chat. Everything's good. Thank you very much, and just carry on. So, being methodology, um, this is actually a very exciting topic. Um, obviously, a very exciting thing that, that that I've learned, which was working in an agile environment. Uh, you know, I only started doing that when I was doing robotics development, uh, and um, you know, agile waterfall, agile. What's best? I think. Uh, you know, in my opinion, you really need to think about adopting the existing framework that your kind of development, uh, you know, panel already has within your organization. That's that's my opinion. Whether that's agile or waterfall, I think when you're bringing in a new technology, which is you you know, uh, robotic process automation, actually it, it is, and it's not the usual kind of way. Um, it doesn't work in a normal way as other technologies. There, there are some differences. Then you will need to think about, you know, and talk about about that with your, um, you, you know, the wider governance team. Uh, look at what's already in place, and start with that. Whether that's waterfall or agile, start with that, and in, take that software development methodology, and 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 don't think about amending it straight away. Take that and focus on robotics as a technology, because you will have a lot, you know, of issues with putting that into your your business. So you don't want to worry about your technology and your framework. So oh, we bring this new technology, and we also want to go agile. And you've been working waterfall for years. <laughs> that's something that's happened, you know. So I was in a place where we worked waterfall forever. And then all of a sudden, because we got a new exciting technology, we want a new exciting way of working. And then that means that the team has to deal with not just the new technology, but also a new way of working, uh, which there isn't any guidance on. So you got to make the guidance as, as well as learn the, the tool and its problems. And that isn't that great. So I would recommend you you continue with what you have in terms of software development framework and then focus on robotics, make sure that's uh, onboarded correctly, then you can uh, fine tune it with the method. So, you know, waterfall agile, I've seen a lot of companies just want to pay lip service and say we work in an agile way, but really they, they're just working waterfall. So, you know, I've had sprints where we've developed code and yeah, we didn't release it, we couldn't, didn't deploy it because, you know, the, the process really wouldn't have worked in an agile way. It had to just be waterfall uh, because it was an unattended process that needed to produce an end-to-end -end kind of result. Uh, but because agile just sounds great, we needed to work that way and just added additional work. And that can affect, uh, you know, the team. So, uh, and another thing you need to think about as well is when you're onboarding these projects, um, how are you going to go about working? You know, is your team going to individually produce uh, projects each, or are you going to have groups of people in working in collaboration? And again, this goes back to adopting the existing uh, framework that you have in your workplace. You know, if you had a system where people are used to having their own projects forever and all of a sudden you start with this exciting new technology and then you say now we're doing agile and you're going to work collaboratively and you haven't really thought about uh, onboarding it properly then you know robotics it, it's going to have be challenging as, as it is on its own and then you're going to have the challenges of actually having this new framework and um, so my advice would be um, focus on one thing at a time, uh, and and when it comes to robotics, it's complex technology um, to implement, and it's different. A lot of uh, you know places where you already have software development, uh, uh, you know guidance, you will still need to amend that guidance for robotics. You know, an example would be you know in a place that I've I've worked recently is that uh, for example. Um, we needed to install robots in users' machines because they were attended robots, and for that we needed, um, you know, admin rights, uh, domain admin rights, so that we could do that work. 
uh, you know, and in general, that company wasn't giving admin rights uh, for you, domain admin rights for you to do stuff like that. So that was a big change. And we needed to introduce the technology, say, okay, this is work slightly different. Yes, we're doing development, but we don't just do development and deploy without any client interaction. We actually work with the client on their machine. So we need these rights. So that's just one example of the challenges you can get. And uh, uh, you want to avoid uh, challenges with the way you work as well as that. So. So that was that. Uh, just going to check the the chat, make sure everything's fine before I go on to the next bit, and just check for time. So we've got another 15 minutes. Um, so we've got a question here: Is waterfall really useful for RPA projects? Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, it just depends on how you work. So the place I was working in, uh, you know, it was unattended robots and uh, it was um, all on VMs, and the processes that we were looking at, they wouldn't really deliver any benefit if we did the agile way, or, you know, the main, really, the main reason was that our team just was not used to working in an agile and a scrum way. Um, so, you know, the way we actually started trying to implement that, it turned out to be waterfall in the end. So I think waterfall and agile, um, you know, can work for you and can be very efficient depending on how you implement it and whether your organization and your process is suited for that. So I think what's happening a lot in the industry is waterfall gets been said that, you know, is the old way of working. Yes, it is, but there is places where it's still applicable. So you're going to have to think about that and, and see what's best for you. So what I'd like to quickly cover is uh, lesson number four, which is quite important and it's to do with the pipeline. and um, you know, this has come up a lot in every uh, project I've worked in. I've had this a lot, you know. So the the main issue is um, you need to think about how much work you've got ready in the pipeline. Um, you know, how much analysis have you already done and covered with all your, um, you know, prospect automations? Uh, because what I would recommend that you do is you have multiple projects ready. Because like I said, there are a lot of challenges with implementing robotics as a technology within your organization to start with. And that can get blockers when you start a project. So for example, like I just talked about the, uh, you know, the uh, the installation and, and domain rights, the, you could have other challenges like for example, you know, Outlook um, blocking programmatic access and you need to amend group policy for that. That means you've got to take it to security, get it approved, that takes a couple of weeks. And sometimes you don't find all these problems when you start because you can't think of everything, right? And you're working an agile way most of the time. So you're just, uh, you know, finding out as, as it happens and that causes a block on a project. And if you don't have enough work in a pipeline, that can affect team morale because you might have developers sitting on their hands. I can't tell you the amount of times this has happened. It's happened a lot in a lot of different types of companies that I've worked for and different types of teams. It happens all the time. So I recommend that you do a lot of analysis beforehand, have a few different pipeline pro projects in the pipeline and manage your stakeholder communication as in, you know, give them, uh, uh, manage the expectations in terms of what you're doing, um, i.e. you're importing this new technology, you will start with this project first. If there's a blocker there, you pick it up, but you may need to go back to that project and just make sure you have enough work for the developers because it really affects team morale. And then when you think about what I talked earlier, there is enough demand in the market, it's very easy for them to leave. Um, so that's something to think about and something that I've seen happen. And I personally have left companies because of lack of work um, because, you know, uh, management was excited to bring this new technology, you know, perhaps make some money, uh, but, you know, they didn't think about, you know, the team morale and the workload that they need to make sure everyone is busy. And we recruited loads of people and in the end, everyone was just sitting there. So not a very efficient way to, to go about it. And uh, it's very important for you to think about that. And that brings me to the, the last and the final point, which is the, kind of puts everything together and all these lessons kind of go together with each other, which is think about your long-term plan. What are you building? Are you building a team that does everything in RPA is just a tool within that team? Or are you actually going full on and building a, a robotic process automation center of excellence? So you've got to think about all these things quite early on because your plan for that 
um, you know, will be quite different. You know, so if you, if, so I've worked in a setting where we were just a team and RPA was just a tool. And in that situation, we didn't really need to think much about the center of excellence, et cetera. There's a few things here and there. But if you're building a center of excellence, then you need to think about a lot of different things. Um, you know, how do you set the standards? Uh, you know, you need to get the workforce that's relevant for that. And uh, yeah, you know, RPA is just a tool, um, but you kind of have a team that just dedicated to it. So it just depends uh, on what your goals are and you've got to think about them. And, you know, you could be a team that's focusing on AI and you start with RPA. That's that's another situation that uh, I've been in. So uh, think about that. And the most important advice that I can give, if there was one advice that I can give and one lesson that I've learned is that make sure that your plan of RPA or onboarding this new technology um, you actually speak with other te technology teams in the business. So um, the reason for that is because they will already have knowledge of the existing systems. And sometimes, yes, you are using RPA and you're using UI for your legacy applications, but let's say you, you need to get data from SQL database. Rather than your team trying to find out everything about that database you know, at the time that they need to, if you've integrated with other teams and you've spoken to other teams that you're bringing this exciting new project in and you get to know what they do, what areas they cover, you build the knowledge you need um, to kind of go, okay, I'm type dialing into the SQL database, the BI team, and we've got someone from BI here and you can probably back me on this, you already know about the databases and where the data is stored. So we can come to you and say, look, which database is it? How do I get access to it? And within, within a few, days, weeks, you've got access and, you know, you don't need to use UI for that part. You can get it instantly through whatever access you've organized uh, because you integrate with other teams, you know about it. You know, I've had a situation where, um, you know, we had a, a company that used BPM for a lot of managing of the workflows um, already. A lot of the work came through that way and we introduced RPA and RPA was obviously taking tasks from there. Uh, but because when they were onboarding, they went to their governance board and all the other teams were there, they said, you know, for BPM, don't don't automate that, use the APIs that we've got. Here you go, here's all the information. And they just put that into the ro robot. And when it came to talking with the BPM, there was no need to use UI. You just literally call the APIs that your other team. So it is a collaborative exercise. And the more collaborative you become, the easier it will be for you this new technology and the better it will be for the long-term plan that you have and, and the longevity of your team and, and it will be seamless integration. So that's basically all of the lessons that I wanted to share with you. I hope that you found them useful. Uh, I, I, it's, a, it's a short time to cover all of them, but I'm, I'm hoping that I wasn't too quick on, on everything. So really appreciate for you to you know take your time and listen to me. And uh, please do connect with me on LinkedIn um, if you've got any, any more questions. So I think we've got a bit of time for us to cover some questions here. Um, so yeah, we've got about seven minutes. So if there are any questions or any comments, it doesn't have to be any questions. You can add some comments of uh, what, you know, what you've come across from what I've talked about and, um, you know, someone may find that useful. Um, so, so yes, let me just, ch just check here. So, um, perfect. So we've got a question from Dan here. What are the frequent pit pitfalls when implementing RPA and how to avoid them? So, um, I think, um, I've touched upon a lot of, a few different things that, uh, that we've done here, um, a few lessons that I've learned that could be seen as pitfalls. Um, and as I said, the, the main one that I would say for you for, for that I've seen everywhere is onboarding the technology. Um, so as I said, make sure you do speak to other technology teams within your business and make sure that they're aware of what you're doing because they will inevitably have a lot more experience when it comes to the tools that the business and they might make your life easy. Um, I've had a lot of issues, you know, in the, in the current place I'm in, but by leveraging the existing knowledge, we were able to overcome a lot of problems. Um, and, uh, you know, simple things like, you know, I've got the Citrix server, 
and I want to install, uh, you know, um, an extension on it so that RPA works with the Citrix applications natively. You know, if you're trying to find that out for yourself, you have to go to your help desk, who owns this server, blah, blah, blah. But if you have already spoken to different teams, you will probably have some idea where to go and who controls the servers. And if they have managed to do this in the past, how would they would do it? How would they do it? They work with building Citrix applications. How would they do something if they needed to? They will give you the information and you'll have it all easy. So the main pitfall is not sharing um, you know, your journey with the rest of the team in your organization, the technology teams especially, because uh, they will have knowledge that uh, you um you know you're you're looking for hopefully dan that answers your question if you have anything more specific you'd like to know i'm more than happy to to answer that so uh, um is waterfall really useful for rpa projects i think uh already covered that i've done uh, both uh, rpa in uh, agile and also in uh, in waterfall so um, it works both ways. Uh, it just depends on, on your strategy. The, the problem was not whether it's waterfall or agile. The challenge was whether your team works in that way already or not, and it's, if it's going to be a big change for them. So you want to ease them into, uh, into that. So I don't even think that's related to RPA. That's just change management, really. Um, so just don't make the mistake of onboarding robotics and at the same time, because the robotics is new, you implement something new along with it, i.e. how you work. Um, you should do those things separately um, to make sure that you get best of both worlds. So um, that's, I hope that answers your question. Um, yeah, is there any more questions or any comments? I'll be, I'll be, I'll be happy to see some comments um, you know, added if uh, there was any anything anyone wants to share, any experience perhaps uh, from what we talked about today, um, that would be great. There's another question. How to decide if we really need to switch to different RPA tool? That's a really good question, um, Juris. I'm hoping I'm saying your name correctly. Apologies if I'm not. Um, but um, that's a very good question. I think what you need to do is before you go about um, think any tool, think about what your needs are. Um, so firstly, for you to think about your needs, you need to understand robotics as a technology. You need to understand RPA as a technology. What is RPA? What are the advantages and disadvantages? What are the different platforms out there? Uh, and what do they offer? Do you want to go attended or unattended? So you need to have known these to ask these questions way before you choose a platform um, because what you don't want to do is let someone from a platform contacts you and then you say, oh, great, perfect. I'll just take your word for it and let's go. You don't want to do that. If they make you aware of robot or RPA, what you want to do is compare their tool with other tools against what you're looking for because you may be happy with citizen developer. So you may not necessarily need a tool that does a lot of things, or you may be, um, you know, setting up a center of excellence that's going to do AI, and you want a tool that's going to integrate a lot of different things, like Microsoft Power Platform, for example, um, where you've got a lot of different areas included in that. You you may want that, or you may just want a specific RPA tool. So think about your requirements, learn about RPA, think, look at all the tools. There is enough tools and enough time for you to compare them and then make a decision of what you want to go with. And if you make that decision and you find at the end, oh, now I'm, I'm doing this and uh, actually this tool is not really helping me here. I could use this tool to do X, Y, Z a lot easier because they don't have a plugin for this or that. Then, you know, you will know, but at least even if you were to learn later on that it wasn't the right tool, as long as you asked all the right questions right at the beginning, you've done your due diligence and the best you can do. No, the world is not a perfect place and you can't foresee every problem. So, um, you know, when <laughs> when you need to switch your tool, you will know because you'll have a lot of problems with the tool you're, you're, you're chosen. Um, but to avoid the root cause, which is choosing the wrong tool, make sure you you follow the and uh, the, the these, these advices, which is to understand robotics. Don't fall for the marketing. Understand it. Uh, compare the different tools 
and then match those against your requirements. And if they match up, then go for it. And uh, you know, you can always do proof of concepts. You can always get vendors to do proof of concepts for you. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they're trying to sell things to you. So uh, they will be more than happy or obliged to kind of uh, help you and in, in doing some, some initial um, automations. Perfect. So uh, I think that's it. I think that's all we've got time for today. Uh, thank you very much for for um, for joining me. And uh, please do connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you've got any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. Um, I don't think there is any any more questions, and uh, we've run out of time. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, appreciate you joining me today. Bye bye.